Dear subscribers, as you know, we shared many information for you, and we are studying very hard to find current news for you. However, I cannot use this channel for future. Please follow our new channel called As Daily News Report and watch our video to support us. Link in description. Also, you can reach the video we shared on Daily News Report by clicking on the top right button. We highly recommend watching, subscribing and sharing. We will continue to share some news on this channel where we take precautions against some situations for future. Thank you for supporting us. And Alex Stanza, insights and analysis about economics, geopolitics, global finance and gold. Hello, this is Alex Danzik, and I have with me again today the brilliant Mr. Jim Rickards. Good morning, Jim, and welcome back. Good morning, Alex. Great to be with you. So in our last podcast, we did a really deep dive uh, into gold's utility value and mm -hmm. the fundamental reasons humans have used it as a, a form of money for almost 5,000 years of history. And... It's probably one of the best we've ever done, I, I would say. And um, I, I highly recommend it to anybody who wants a more solid understanding of gold. You can find all of our podcasts at physicalgoldfund.com slash podcasts. And Jim, here we are. It's uh, almost the end of 2017. It's been an eventful year. Um, today... Jim and I are going to do a year in review of some of the most important events and issues that have occurred and also uh, that are moving forward, going to have the most impact on our collective futures. We're going to break this down into three sections. The first section is going to be the economy. The second section is going to be conflict. And the third section is going to be lockdown. I know that sounds a little ominous, but you'll understand why when we get there. Um, normally, we stack some of the most important material close to the front of the podcast, but I'm going to encourage all of you to stick with us to the end of this if you can, because some of what we cover at the end is going to be the uh, some of what's most impactful long term in our in our daily lives. So, um, part one, Jim, economy. The first item up on deck is that the wealth gap is widening. According to Ray Dalio, the founder of Bridgewater Capital, the top one tenth of one percent financially speaking, controls as much wealth as the bottom 90% combined. Uh, this hasn't happened in almost 100 years, and he says that real income for the average household has been flat to down for nearly 40 years now. And the issue here, from my perspective, is, is that the monetary system is structured in such a way that over time it advantages sort of rent-seeking behavior versus wage earners. And... Uh, what happens is it slowly siphons wealth away from that bottom sort of 90% in a way that's almost undetectable. Jim, just briefly, because we have a lot of other subjects in the economy category to cover, what are your thoughts about this? Well, uh, Ray Dalio has his facts right. I certainly acknowledge that. There are a lot of ways to express it. He's uh, looked at wealth. Uh, which is a good way to do it. Uh, you can also look at income. Uh, you can also look at income tax. Uh, but uh, who you know who pays the tax? Who's making the income? How much wealth? They're, they're they're different measures, but they all say the same thing, and that's really the point. That whether it's an income skew with you know ten percent of the taxpayers paying ninety percent of the income tax, or five percent of the taxpayers or five percent of the citizens making some very large percentage, well over fifty percent of the all the income or 10% having 90% of the wealth. However you slice it, it all says the same thing. Growing income inequality, wealth inequality, they're different things, by the way. Income uh, income inequality should be a little more troubling. Wealth inequality, um, I hate to say it, but we've always had that. It's, it's always been with us. Uh, but income inequality is important because it, it means even if you're not wealthy, you have a chance. Uh, you might get wealthy, and that's the American dream. The Americans have never particularly resented the wealthy, and the reason was because it, they always viewed it as an opportunity society. And in, in the 1890s, you might look at J.D. Rockefeller or Andrew Carnegie and say, well, they're, they're, they're the robber barons, they're obscenely wealthy, but that's who I want to be. In, in other words, it was sort of a, 
an upwardly mobile, uh, aspirational culture. And the feeling was even if you weren't rich, you could become rich. And the way you would do that was through income, at least initially, and you know, an invention, a job, a business, an adventure, strike a, start a gold mine, whatever it might be. Um, all of that's starting to go away. Not only do we have the wealth skew, but we have an income skew um, that makes it harder and harder to get ju- get that jump start. Uh, this has a lot of causes. Uh, some of them have to do with the breakup of the family. Some of them with the opium epidemic. I think the biggest single one, if I had to pick one, uh, is education in terms of normal social factors. But beyond that, this is, I think, what Ray Dalio is getting at and certainly the point that I would emphasize. Beyond all those things, which we've seen in cycles before, what we have now is really a rigged system. And I know you know, Trump ran, uh, ran his campaign on the idea that it was a rigged system, which is true. And um, Bernie Sanders complained that the Democratic primary were rigged against him, which was also true. So we hear the word rigged a lot, uh, and and, it, and it's true in the in the context of people using it. But I'm using it in a broader context. I want to try to transcend the partisan politics and all the yelling and screaming and sniping that's going on, and and just say that when you when you write the rules in such a way that you're inherently advantaging one group, disadvantaging another, making it impossible for people to ever catch up or ever get ahead, uh, that's a very serious societal problem. Now, it's not just a problem in terms of the equities. You might be troubled by the the equity, the morality, uh, you know, is it right or wrong? Those those are, you know, kind of moral, ethical issues. I don't um, gainsay them or dismiss them in any way. I think they're important ones. But as an analyst, particularly an analyst of uh, capital markets and Geopolitics. Uh, what's troubling is that that those are signs of societal breakdown, um, and, it, and historically societies have done something about it. And you look at, you know, could you do it through the ballot box? Could you do it through democratic processes? Well, not really, because once the thing gets rigged enough, um, it, you know, you, you've got, uh, you know, whether it's advertising spending, uh, social media manipulation, propaganda. We saw some of this with. Uh, you know, Russian involvement in the last election, but we don't have to confine the criticism to Russia. I mean, just um, just Facebook and Google and, and Yahoo and Amazon and all those uh, those tech giants alone with their own algorithms and their own efforts and their own news filters, et cetera, are uh, affecting how people think about things. Not necessarily, I'm, uh, not necessarily Democrat versus Republican or liberal versus conservative. Sure. Again, I'm trying to I'm trying to get past that. I'm trying to transcend that and say that this is not a struggle between left and right, Republicans and Democrats. This is a struggle between elites and everyday people. Yeah, totally. And agree. what's important. What's important for people to understand is the Democrats and Republicans are in it together. Now, Trump, Trump is a disruptor. Trump's kind of the uber of politics, if you want to think of it that way. And that's why everybody hates him. I mean, the Democrats hate Trump, but so do most of the Republicans, and they're increasingly outspoken about it. But the reason is because he's not playing their game, their rigged game. So right. we have a problem. And then just to take it one step further, and then I'll, I'll wrap up on this because I know we have a lot else to talk about. You say to yourself, well, how, do societies, how do societies get out of that? Uh, well, one way they do it is with with extreme violence and, and in particular war. It's not usually done through the ballot box. It's not usually done through reform. Uh, it's done through war. Uh, and uh, there, there are a couple uh, you know, we've talked in the past. We don't spend a lot of time today on a war with North Korea. But beyond that, whether it's a civil war, um, an international war, or just kind of some kind of social breakdown. That's how societies deal with it. So these trends are very disturbing in the sense that when people get frustrated enough, they will take to the streets uh, and start tearing things down and burning things down. And that's how you uh, level the playing field. Okay. Uh, next on deck. By the way, that that entire discussion we could we could probably spend a whole podcast going down that rabbit hole but uh we, we for the sake of time we do have to move on the the next item is uh system instability and uh jim in one of our many conversations this year we've talked about how system fragility is is really now because of complex because the capital markets and, and the economy is a complex system that it's a function of scale and uh that the financial system has still really not deleveraged from the 2008 uh, global financial crisis. And an interesting thing has sort of been happening amongst um, institutional investors where their due diligence used to be primarily focused on transparency. You know, we used to have the whole Madoff uh, issue and 
who's keeping track of the books and who's cooking the books and how do you get away with it and who has custody of the money, who has uh, signatory authority, all those different kinds of things. That used to be the biggest focus after the whole Madoff incident, but nowadays the highest priority has become is it liquid and how is it liquid and they want to know why it's liquid. And so Jim, do you think that institutions prioritizing liquidity uh, in their due diligence stack is telling us something about the true fragility in the system. Well, I think it is, um, and you know, we'll expand on that a little bit, but the specific kind of due diligence you're discussing, Alex, and you're right about it, this is how uh, clearing brokers and banks and investors in hedge funds, for example, look at the hedge fund. Uh, and you're right, after the spectacular failure of Madoff, uh, everyone says, well, how could we have missed that? Uh, well, the answer is all you had to do is ask two more questions and you would have found it in a heartbeat. But nobody <laughs> right. nobody, nobody asked the questions, you know, is your auditor reputable? Have I ever heard of them? Can I talk to your auditor? You know, all the, all the, I don't have to get on the compliance checklist, but you're exactly right. Uh, but now they're looking at liquidity. So they say, well, you want me to invest in your hedge fund. I might want to get my money out really fast. And so I need to know how liquid are you because one of the uh, lessons – learned in the 2008 meltdown um, was that a lot of hedge funds just suspended redemptions. Uh, investors said, I'll put 20 million in this hedge fund and 50 million in this hedge fund. And you know, if the manager screws up or performance is bad or I need the money for whatever reason, I'll just put in my redemption notice. I might have to wait 30 days or 45 days, whatever it might be, and I'll get my money back. And what they found out is, no, uh, it's not that simple. And uh, I've, I've literally, I've read and written and negotiated hundreds of offering documents for alternative investments, mostly hedge funds, but some private equity funds as well. Uh, I can I can see them in my sleep. And I've never seen one that did not have a suspension clause. Now, it's usually on page 57. It's in fine print. you got to be a geek to read it. And a lot of investors never bother. But in there, it says, oh, yeah, you can have your money quarterly on 30 days notice, so 45 days to pay. Um, no problem. Send us a notice. Here's the address. But somewhere in a different part of the document it says, oh, by the way, in the event that the manager in his sole discretion deems it in the best interest of all the investors to suspend redemptions, we can do that anytime we want. I mean, it doesn't literally say that, but that's the effect. And that's how um, you protect yourself against a run on the bank. If a lot of investors want their money all at once, and you've got, you know, you probably typically have some liquid assets, you might have some uh, treasury notes or uh, some, you know, margin money or uh, bank deposits somewhere. But a lot of it, depending on the strategy, might be illiquid. You might be in emerging markets. You might be in, uh, you know, Turkish stocks or Brazilian stocks or Thai. Uh, dollar-denominated corporate debt, and that stuff is not always as liquid as you think, certainly not in a financial panic. And so you say, well, gee, if I give the first guy's money, the last guy in line or the next guy in line is going to get you know, disadvantaged because I'm going to have to sell increasingly uh, less liquid assets at, in mm -hmm. at increasingly worse prices. Um, and so that's unfair, so I'll just suspend redemptions. So I don't know why people were so surprised, but that's that's been in there since day one. But there's a bigger picture out there, you're right, and that's that's what um, uh, asset allocators are asking of the hedge funds. But what about the banks? What about non-leveraged players like mutual funds? What about mega wealth managers like uh, you know BlackRock, for example? I don't want to pick on BlackRock, but they're, they are the biggest, So, uh, but there are many, you know, Fidelity, Vanguard, you know, on and on and on. Um, how liquid are they? I mean, they're, they, they're, they take retail money. They take money from everybody. What about money market funds? Money market funds are supposed to be the most liquid thing you can buy short of treasury bills. Like if I buy a 30-day treasury bill, that's that's as close to a cash equivalent as you can get, and it should be easily saleable and never should, should never take a big loss on that under any state of the world. Uh, and there are facilities for doing that. But money market funds are, are a close cousin. They're supposed to be just as liquid. Um, well, the answer is that, A, they're not as liquid as you might think. The treasury bills are, but but uh, money market funds um, actually did suspend redemptions in 2008, and that came as a shock. And It was so bad that the government actually had to come along and guarantee every money market fund in America just to stop the run on the bank, to stop people from pulling their money out. Mm -hmm. Now, there's this notion that, you know, we got past 2008, we learned our lessons, we deleveraged the system, it's much safer now, the banks are safer, and as Janet Yellen said, we'll never see another uh, crisis like that in our lifetimes. She said that a few months ago, by the way, when I heard that, I 
Um, I almost wanted to dig a hole and put you know, stick cash in it because I said that's a that's a sure sign of a coming collapse when uh, she says we're not going to have one. But the point being, uh, none of what I just said is true. The system is not safer. It is not less leveraged. It is not more liquid. None of that is true. Um, the Fed printed four trillion dollars of money, uh, but uh, um, institutions added over one hundred trillion dollars of debt on top of that. There is a global dollar shortage uh, has been well pointed out uh, Jeff Snyder at Alhambra, but others have uh, sort of been on that case relentlessly. And, and the people have trouble getting, they can't get their minds around that. Go, Wait a second, how could there be a dollar shortage if the Fed printed four trillion? Well, the answer is that the world created a hundred trillion dollars of debt on top of the four trillion of uh, base money. And so your system's leveraged 25 to one. And uh, and if, if more than a small fraction of those people, more than 5% of those people wanted their money back tomorrow, you couldn't do it because you'd have to start selling something, whether it's stocks or bonds or emerging markets or currencies or gold or commodities, whatever it might be. And so um, the system is as leveraged as ever, uh, more fragile than ever. Uh, and then you hear about derivatives, you know, the famous number of derivatives after 2008 were heading to one quadrillion dollars of gross notional value. But quadrillion, by the way, is a thousand trillion if you're keeping score at home. Uh, and uh, that was an obvious sign of danger. And then, and then that number started to go down a little bit. The Bank for International Settlements um, surveys the banks every three years and they print some very good research on that anonymously. They don't do it bank by bank. But uh, you can see these numbers in, in the aggregate. And the most recent report went down a little bit. And everyone's like, see, the system is safer. Nonsense. What they didn't tell mm -hmm. you uh, is that a lot of it was moved over to clearinghouses. In other words, yes, the none of it's on balance sheet. But none of it's on balance sheet. It's all off balance sheet. You have to go to the footnotes to find it. But even if you do and you say, well, gee, it went down a little bit. Well, that's only because it it was moved off the bank balance sheets onto the clearinghouse balance sheets. And it's bigger than ever. And that doesn't make the system safer um, because, oh, you're just hiding the ball. The, the total innocence, the key thing about a systemic crisis, Alex, is that it's systemic. In other words, that's what that means. Everybody in the system is affected. It's not that yeah. one bank fails or one broker fails. It's the whole system fails. And so um, say, well, it's not on the balance sheet of J.P. Morgan. It's not on the balance sheet of Citi. It's over here at the clearinghouse. Really? Who's guaranteeing the clearinghouse? Where's the capital in the clearinghouse? Where are they going to get the money if certain counterparties uh, – if, if, if you've netted things out, there's still some net balance due to a counterparty. If that counterparty fails, then those transactions get thrown back to the original counterparties and you get right back to the same cascade you were trying to prevent in the first place. I'm not saying that clearinghouses are bad things. I actually think they're good things. They do provide more information. They do make netting easier, but they don't ensure you against failure. And the clearinghouses themselves are going to have to turn back to the banks for guarantees or capital to meet their obligations. So the, just to, to um, cut this short a little bit, the system's bigger than ever. Now, in terms of complexity theory, and complexity theory is a branch of science. It's a discipline, uh, very well developed. It is the best way to understand risk in capital markets. Yeah. All the systems people use, regressions, correlations, value at risk, they're all uh, highly defective at best and dangerous at worst because they lull you into a false sense of... Uh, complacency about what's really going on. So, sure. they're, so they're not a good way. But when you look at complexity theory, it tells you that risk is an exponential function of scale, meaning if you double or triple the scale, the size of the system, in other words, you do not double or triple the risk. You increase it by a factor of 10 or 100. So the system's riskier than ever. The leverage is greater than ever. Uh, it's been moved around. Yeah, some maybe household debt uh, to uh, income ratios are better. That's true, but that's all. That's simply because the government lifted the debt off the household, and the government uh, debt to GDP ratios are worse than ever. Mm -hmm. So the system's not safer. It's riskier. It's exponentially riskier. Uh, we're just waiting for a catalyst. Um, it it could come tomorrow. It doesn't have to come tomorrow. It doesn't have to come next year. Uh, by the way, I do think that. Um, you know, 2018 will be interesting in that regard. It, you know, we're doing a, a little bit of a year review. One thing about 2017, it was it was a year when all the bad things didn't happen. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's all good. It's like standing on a fault line on the San Andreas Fault, and that there's no earthquake that day. Well, that's good. You weren't in an earthquake. But does that mean the system is stable? No, it's not stable at all. Sure. Forces are continuing to build up. So, 2018 may be. Um, 
the year when some of the fault lines begin to, you know, shake, rattle and roll a little bit. You know, Jim, just, just listening to you summarize all that, by the way, that was an incredible summary. I, I read about this kind of stuff all day long, every day, you know, I do, we, we, we talk about it. Um, yep. And, you know, even though I'm, I'm aware of it, hearing you put it all together like that, I just have to sit here and shake my head. It's just, it's incredible the what's, what's going on and uh, the state of the, um, the energy state, so to speak, of, of the way the system's looking right now. And that, that really, whatever sets this thing off, I mean, man. It's going to be interesting, certainly, when it when it starts coming down the coming down the mountain. So, okay, moving on. We have we we're going to have to do this part pretty quick, Jim. Very briefly on uh, central banking. Um, just one quick comment comment from me is is that uh, this is one trend that's been a continuation uh, over the last probably five or six years. Is central central banks around the world are continuing to accumulate and hoard gold. And uh, it's a trend that I think is far more important um, than the level of attention that it's given over the long term. But we don't have time to dive into that very briefly. Um, Jim, tell us about the Fed very briefly. <laughs> um, well, I think uh, listeners, uh, certainly regular listeners know the, the basic model, uh, but there has been a big, big change in it literally just in the last couple of weeks. And it affected what the Fed did uh, on December 13th. Of course, they made a decision to raise rates 25 basis points. Um, that was uh, that was easy to see coming in the home stretch. But earlier on, I had been of the view that they would not raise rates. But I had a, a basis for that. So the, the base, uh, which I'll explain in a second, but the base model is Fed's on track to raise rates four times a year, every March, June, September, and December for the next several years until they get to three and a quarter, three and a half percent. The reason they're doing that, notwithstanding weak economic growth, is that they have to get rates up so they can cut them in the next recession. It sounds odd. Why are you raising them so you can cut them? Well, that's the point. They feel that they can raise them without sinking markets today. But if there's a recession or worse, if there's some sort of market collapse or calamity in the next year or two, they'll have it. It's just like putting, it's just like reloading a, a gun. You know, you're putting bullets in the chamber. It doesn't mean you're going to fire them off right away, but you, you're capable of that if it comes to it. Every time the Fed raises 25 basis points, they put another bullet in the chamber that they can cut if they have to. So that's what they're doing. That's why they're doing it. I also identified three pause factors, three times when the Fed won't hike rates, notwithstanding the baseline scenario. And we saw that. Through all of 2015, you know, in March 2015, the Fed removed forward guidance, and Wall Street said, here we go, they're going to raise them in June, raise them in September. They didn't. They did raise them in December. Then they went through all of that. Then they said, we're going to raise them four times next year, meaning 2016. They didn't. They went through seven meetings in 2016, did not raise rates. Finally, December 2016, they did raise rates, and then so on. Uh, through 2017, uh, did raise in March and June, did not raise in September. So they, they have a baseline scenario of raising four times a year, but they don't always do it. What are the pause factors? What are the reasons why they don't do it? The answer is a disorderly stock market decline. That's what we saw in September 2015 and um, uh, March 2016. Both of those meetings came in the wake of 11% correction. So the Fed said this is not a time to raise rates. So that's when that factor was operative. Um, unemployment uh, drying up or going negative, that has not happened. We did have one negative print in September, but that was clearly because of hurricanes. So that has not been in play. The third factor is disinflation. So we've seen the Fed skip a couple uh, rate hikes because of disorderly stock market declines. That's not a problem today. Stock market's booming. Um, job creation, not a problem today. That's steady eddy. Uh, that's mission accomplished. Disinflation is the one that concerns the Fed. And that was why I expected that they would not raise in December. I'd, at least uh, up until November, I did. I expected they wouldn't because the, the, the inflation numbers were awful. I mean, awful from the Fed's perspective. Their target is 2%. And the, the metric they watched went from 1.9 to 1.3 between January and August. It was weak and getting weaker. Um, but then on November 30th, uh, it came in at 1.4, and then September was revised to 1.4. So all of a sudden, is, uh, August kind of looked like the bottom. That's pretty thin gruel. Uh, that, those numbers are still weak in my view. 
But they were just good enough for Yellen to say, see, I told you it was transitory. It's coming back my way. I, <laughs> this, is, this is mostly – believe me, this is statistical noise and rounding errors when you go from 1.3 to 1.4. I wasn't impressed by it. But Yellen, it gave her enough cover. But And so they did raise rates. So after I saw November 30th and I saw that inflation number, I said, eh, this is just enough for her to you know, call it transitory and move on. But – all of that analysis that I just gave about the four hikes a year, the times they don't the, they don't hike, the pause factors, all that stuff, it's a very excellent frame of analyzing the Fed. There's now a new factor. I have updated my Fed model literally in the last several days based on new information. That's what we do is – that's what – it's called Bayes' rule. When you get new information, you update your model. You don't just cling to the, the old one. Mm -hmm. uh, and here's, here's the new information. This is really to get to your point, Alex. The Fed has now put uh, the bubble factor, market uh, bubble behavior, uh, they call it um, you know, systemic risk uh, or financial stability. So financial stability is the fancy term the Fed uses, but just think of it as fear of bubbles. That's what they're talking about. That has now entered into the equation. Now, I had a conversation several years ago with uh, the ultimate Fed insider, a, a person not on the Board of Governors, but who might as well have been. He was the head of all this communications policy, all the stuff I talked about. When do you pause? When do you not pause? Forward guidance, how do you say it? Mm -hmm. He was the head of that, you know, had an office across the hall from Yellen and Bernanke for all those years. And I said to him, uh, I said, is, is Yellen worried about a stock market bubble. Bear in mind, this is a couple of years ago, probably 5,000 Dow points ago. Mm -hmm. And he, he said to me, not yet. Meaning that, you know, it might come into play someday, but, but literally not yet. And so that was never a factor. It hasn't been a factor. Suddenly, that same individual, same person has signaled that, yes, this has now entered into their thinking. They are concerned about it. They understand that if the stock market gets into bubble territory and the bubble crashes, that could undo nine years of work by the Fed. Everything they've tried to do to restore financial stability, um, help bank earnings, help banks gather capital, get people back in the stock market, get retail rock and rolling again, um, you know, get self-sustaining growth, all that work that they've done, get interest rates back up, normalize the balance sheet. Think of it as nine years in the cold with a shovel digging a ditch in, in solid ground. That's how, that's how they think about mm -hmm. what they've done. It could all go away if the stock market crashed. So suddenly, they, and the Fed does not like to identify bubbles. They, this is the, the Fed tightened in 1927, and scholars ever since, from Milton Friedman to Anna Schwartz to Ben Bernanke, have been unanimous in the view that that was a, a blunder that the Fed tightened when they should have eased. Uh, by the way, under the old gold standard, gold was flowing into New York at the time. This is in, you know, again 1927, uh, 1928 rather. Um, and gold was flowing in, and the Fed should have been easing under the what were called the rules of the rules of the game, but the Fed didn't. They tightened because they tried. They thought there was a stock bubble. They tried to pop it. Well, they did pop it. They popped it disastrously and caused the Great Depression. So ever since then, the Fed has been very wary of trying to pick bubbles or pop bubbles. The fact that they're doing it says that they're genuinely concerned. This, by the way, is a factor in favor of tightening. I, 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 I gave disinflation as a factor, as a pause factor, reason not to tighten. But one of the reasons the Fed did tighten on December 13th, notwithstanding the weak inflation numbers, was because they're worried about this bubble factor. So now going forward, beginning with the March meeting, I mean, they won't do anything in January, but beginning with the March meeting, uh, I, I'm working with the updated model, and I've got to weigh that factor, which which tilts in favor of rate hikes. But of course, the the question I've asked before is, can you prepare for the next crash by raising rates without causing the crash you're preparing to cure? Mm -hmm. uh, that's the finesse, and the answer is so far so good. But I'm very skeptical about their ability to uh, play that finesse much longer. Okay. Well, we'll take a look at that again. Probably in uh, in January uh, or February of next year. So, next uh, area that we're going to talk about today, part two, conflict. This is, uh, of course, about North Korea. Jim, you and I started covering North Korea way back in the first part of 2017. This was before yep. really anybody was talking about it in the MSM. 
uh, it's it's turned out to be a pretty significant issue. And uh, Jim, you've been real accurate in your calls on how this would progress. And uh, <laughs> it's funny because um, this is another one of those areas where you'll say something. And I'm like, really, Jim? I mean, I'm not I'm not saying that out loud, but in my brain, I'm going, really, Jim? And it turns out it's right again. Um, but anyway, the U.S. has done quite a bit of saber rattling on this issue. So hundreds of aircraft are have been participating in simulated bombing runs over the, the Korean Peninsula. Um, there's now three nuclear-powered supercarrier groups within striking range of North Korea, but hasn't made a difference. Everything's Trump said, the fire and fury, all that kind of has made no difference. Um, North, continu North Korea has continued its... Um, its nuclear weapons program. Uh, they just, well, since the last time we talked about it, uh, they have tested a new missile that the U.S. has designated the KN-22. We've never seen anything like it before, as far as from North Korea, at least. Uh, there's several things about this latest test that kind of changes the threat to an entirely new level. Number one, the uh, launch pro uh, platforms are now mobile. And that makes them much harder to detect, makes a first launch uh, much harder to detect. Um, the test they did was conducted at night, which simulates a live launch under war fighting conditions. Um, and experts are saying this latest missile is big by any nation's standards and that few countries could build a missile this big and actually make it work. Uh, it uses two gimbaled engines. And for those who you are not familiar with that. Gimbling basically means they can point the engines in any direction that they want to achieve um, directional thrust. And again, uh, we've never seen the North Koreans do this before. And in theory, this much larger missile can carry a much bigger payload. So this represents a pretty substantial leap forward in technology. The missile, when they fired it, it had an apogee of 4,500 kilometers and it was in the air for something like 50 minutes. And it was fired apparently almost straight out because uh, presumably or presumably they want to test its endurance without have, having to uh, circle the earth with it and freak everybody out. But uh, if it had been fired on a standard trajectory, uh, some experts are claiming that it would be it would have the range basically to reach anywhere within the continental United States. Now, Jim, being honest, I, I personally didn't really take the North Korea capability all that seriously until now. It, to me, it was like a contest where one guy had an M1 Abrams tank and the other guy had a BB gun. But this leap forward in tech is pretty serious in my view. Uh, some experts think it's, it's too late to stop them, to stop this nu uh, nuclear program at this point. Where does this go, Jim? Um, well, first of all, that's an excellent summary, Alex. We'll, we'll take a little further, but everything you said is, is first accurate. It uh, checks out with uh, with my understanding, my observations. By the way, I am familiar with gimbling technology because I use a, a gimbaled a cup holder for my rum punch when I'm sailing. It, it, if the boat's healing, it, the drink stays steady and doesn't doesn't tip over. It's, uh, so it's, it's just a way to tilt things, and that's uh, that's exactly right. Uh, by the way, one other feature, I'll come back to the, the geo strategic aspects of this, but one other feature of the missile um, is that the the nose cone, it was absolutely as large and powerful as you described, but the nose cone was, first of all, rounded, not pointed. Uh, that suggests a nose cone that is detachable that can hold multiple warheads. Mm -hmm. If you're only ever going to have one warhead, it can be skinny and pointed, and you put a skinny, narrow uh, you know, nuclear device, a nuclear warhead in there, and it hits the target or you know, detonates above the target typically um, you know, in, the, in the low atmosphere. But the reason you have more of a rounded hinge type of design is for multiple warheads. That's, the missile's a game changer. What's called MIRVing, uh, multiple independent reentry vehicles, is a game changer. This thing is uh, it's hard to overstate um, the importance of it. So that's all correct. Now, um, and the U.S. will not tolerate it. That has been clear. We will not allow North Korea to have an arsenal of any size of intercontinental ballistic missiles with nuclear uh, warheads that can hit the United States. We won't let them do it. They are just as clearly going for that. They are going for the thing that we 
mm-hmm. say they can't have. So this is a game of chicken. It's with you know perhaps millions of lives at stake, but it's basically a game of chicken. Uh, I don't want to take a lot of time to explain, uh, you know, how we got here because um, people say, well. Is he crazy? No, he's not crazy. Kim Jong Un. There's a lot of history here and a lot of failures of American foreign policy, including the fact that the history is if you give up your nuclear weapons program, we invade you and kill you. Yeah. That's what we did to Gaddafi. That's what we did to Saddam Hussein. The Ukrainians gave up their nuclear weapons from the old Soviet Union. They got invaded, and Crimea was the next. The Iranians kept theirs, and they're still standing. That's the short history of it. But Kim Jong-un looks at that and says, I'm better off with these weapons than without them, because if I get them, you won't mess with me. But if I give them up, you'll come in and kill me. He's not wrong about that. That's, That's kind of what history says. The U.S. has said you can't have them, period. So when when he's going for it in breakout mode and feels he's better with them than without them, and we're saying he can't have them, that's a collision course. That's heading for war. Now the the question is, um, is there is there some uh, some way to avoid that? Number one, and number two, uh, is it um, you know is it already too late, or when will this war happen? Uh, and actually, uh, there have been a lot of developments in the last. 24 hours. And I, I said I updated my Fed model uh, based on new news. Well, I've updated my North Korea model as well. The um, the, the dynamic towards war, the 70% probability of war, I, just to kind of go through the probabilities quickly, uh, there's, I, I give 0% chance that we're bluffing, meaning that we will tolerate a nuclear arm North Korea. We, we won't do that. Uh, so I give that zero. I give a, um, a 20% chance that Kim Jong-un will be assassinated, or there'll be some kind of regime change without a war, messy business, but but no war necessary. I give only a 10% chance that Kim Jong-un will stand down, meaning he will voluntarily and transparently give up these programs, and then that leaves a 70% chance of war. I have not changed those odds, but I have pushed out the timeline a little bit. I have been saying before the end of March, Perhaps the summer uh, was a better estimate right now. Uh, and he, here's what's happened literally just in the, in the past couple of days. The U.S., because uh, how do you want to get out of this? Well, you want to talk to the North Koreans. You want the U.S. and North Koreans to engage in dialogue and have that dialogue have some kind of end game and for that to be fruitful. And um, we had a precondition. We said to Kim Jong-un, you have to, uh, in effect, stop testing your weapons, stop developing your weapons and then we'll talk, um, and then that's then we'll go from there. Sit, but you, you can't. You definitely can't have the weapons. But we want you to stop testing them, stop developing them, and then we'll have a talk. And we're not going to talk about talking. Yesterday, in remarks before, uh, or sorry, a couple of days ago, in remarks before uh, the Atlantic Council, Rex Tillerson, our Secretary of State, said, "No, we'll talk without preconditions." He kind of dropped the precondition, um, which gives North Korea the ability to come into the to the room and talk to the United States and feel like there it's peer to peer. In other words, nuclear power to nuclear power, you know, you, we don't, you can't dictate to us. We'll come talk to you, but you're not going to tell us the ground rules. We'll just come into the room. And Tillerson said, just talk, just talk about the weather, talk about the shape of the table. I mean, he literally said that, uh, obviously an open invitation. Number one, number two, there was something in the air called freeze for freeze. Freeze for freeze means North Korea will freeze its nuclear weapons developments programs if um, the U.S. freezes joint military exercises with the South Koreans and the Japanese, you know, concerning Korea. Now, the U.S. said we will not agree to freeze for freeze because we do these joint military exercises all the time. We've been doing them for 50 years in different ways. Uh, and you can not dictate the tempo of operational readiness to us. Sure. Uh, so, so we're not going to agree to that. Um, but now the South Koreans have said, well, you know, OK, we hear you, but. You know, we got the Olympics coming up. Ticket sales are slow, by the way. We got the Winter Olympics coming up in uh, thir- like 30 miles or so from the DMZ in Korea. Uh, and would you, the United States, mind just postponing the next, you know, previously scheduled joint military exercise until after the Olympics are over? And oh, by the way, throw in the Paralympics, you know, because they always had the Paralympics after the Olympics. And so this sort of pushes you out to the end of March. Well, what's interesting about that is the U.S. could say – Yes to that without losing face. In other words, we can say, okay, well, we're not we're not letting North Korea dictate the tempo of readiness operations, but we will help our friends, the South Koreans, enjoy the Olympics without international tension. 
So all of a sudden, you've got Rex Tillerson saying, you know, the door's open, North Korea, you don't really have to agree to anything. And you've got America saying, well, maybe we will postpone this one. But, you know, it's not, for, it's not because of North Korea, it's because of something else. It doesn't matter. It's the same thing. So now the question is, are you talking about something that looks like freeze for freeze? And are you in a dialogue? And um, uh, on Thursday, December uh, 14th, uh, North Koreans and Americans are actually meeting face to face in Chiang Mai in Thailand. Very out of the way place, a little bit off the run. We won't know immediately what happened, but but uh, this is sort of this is, these aren't uh, peace talks. These are uh, just you know uh, diplomatic contacts, just to see if you can get something going. Mm -hmm. So, having said all that, those should all be regarded as positive signs. They're signs that. Uh, maybe you know the war won't be before the end of March. Maybe we're looking at the summer. Uh, maybe there's some opening here. Maybe tensions will dial down, dial down a little bit. Having said that, having said all of that, there is no evidence that Kim Jong Un has actually changed his posture. Right. Meaning, uh, remember, he had a deal in 1996 with Bill Clinton. Not he. His father had a deal in 1996 with Bill Clinton. His father also had a deal in 2006 with George Bush. We've seen this movie before. The, the North Koreans say, yeah, give us some fuel and we'll stop developing nuclear weapons. Or give us some uranium and we'll stop our own uranium enrichment, you know, et cetera. They lie. They play for time. They break every deal. This is why Trump didn't want to agree to preconditions, he said, because you get, we don't trust you. Uh, so... I, I see no evidence that the North has actually um, changed their behavior. They could um, they could actually not test weapons for a while, not because they've changed their goal or their or their method, but you know, as far as detonating devices is concerned, you know, they're, they're suffering what's called mountain fatigue. They've blown so many, blown up so many nuclear weapons, including an H bomb, inside this mountain testing facility. They have that there's some danger that the mountain is going to collapse. Mm -hmm. So, and the, one tunnel did collapse, killed several hundred workers. So, they're either going to have to uh, reinforce that mountain, or build new tunnels, or come up with a new testing site. That could all take time. And having um, created the ICBM, the one you described, the KN2, I think we call it the Hwasong, uh, KN-22, I think we call it, they call it the Hwasong-15, same missile, um, having come that far, they could do a lot. They could be like just kind of downloading whatever data is available to them from the launch. They could be working on miniaturization of the warheads. You can do that in an engineering facility in a laboratory. They could be working on regularization of the reentry vehicles. You can do that in a wind tunnel. They actually have wind tunnels where one end of the wind tunnel is not a big fan. It's actually a rocket engine. And you, you fly, um, you, you put a warhead or, or a nose cone uh, in the other end of the wind tunnel and see how it does against that kind of heat and uh, vibration, which is a simulation of reentering the atmosphere. Mm -hmm. So they're doing that. So, so they could be doing a lot in the meantime, cheating, in other words, uh, while still going through the pretense of talking. The U.S. seems to open, open the door. Having said all that, the the White House, within minutes of Tillerson's remarks, came out and said, yeah, we, we know what the secretary said, but we haven't changed our position. And McMaster said it's still the case that they can't have these weapons. So I don't see that North Korea has really changed. I don't see that the U.S. has really changed in terms of where you end up. But in terms of process, it may be the case that we have a little bit of dialogue and the appearance of some uh, – some improvement over the next couple of months, but I don't see really any change uh, in, in the end game. Now, one last thing, Alex, and you mentioned, uh, you know, they've got us, you know, maybe it's too late. Um, well, the answer is they might have an intermediate range missile with an atomic warhead. That's different from an ICBM with a hydrogen warhead, hydrogen right. bomb device, fusion, uh, fusion device. They might have uh, an intermediate range uh, missile with a missile with uh, an atomic device. That's still a pretty nasty thing. That's what we used in Hiroshima, although that was a bomb, not a uh, not a missile. But um, but that won't deter the United States. We uh, are not going to trade Seattle for Seoul. Uh, we're not going to trade Pittsburgh for Pusan. Uh, we're not going to do it. And so uh, we're still going to put an end to this North Korean program. But on a just to end on a slightly more positive note, it's not that millions of South Koreans have to die in this fight. Uh, you know, Alex, in one of our calls, and it might have been a few months ago, I raised the possibility of secret weapons. Yeah, and I said I said that I had spoken to a Chinese national security. Well, the the top 
um, academic national security advisor in China, a lady who runs an institute at um, Tsinghua University, who advises the the military and the the the, the leadership in uh, in communist China. And I'd raised this with her. She said she heard the same thing from Ash Carter, former Secretary of Defense, and it was a little skeptical. And I said, "Look, do you think do you actually think DARPA and Los Alamos?" And the Jet Propulsion Laboratory haven't been doing anything for the last 15 years. That's a good point. Yeah, you know, of course they have. We yep. just don't know. That's what a secret weapon is. The atomic bomb was secret until we dropped it. Right. Well, since then, a couple of very interesting developments. Um, some of these things are being leaked. It's not like you know I broke into a safe at Los Alamos and stole the secret plans. The the military that are leaking them on purpose. Because they want the North Koreans to know and they want the Chinese to know exactly what our capabilities are. Not exactly, but to, to some extent. Uh, and there are two weapons in particular I mentioned. One's called the Wave Rider. That's the code name for something which was the X-51. Uh, Boeing was developing the X-51. They took a dark uh, code name Wave Rider. Um, this is a hypersonic missile. Hypersonic means multiple times the speed of sound. So uh, whether it's three times or six times the speed of sound, we're talking about things that uh, by the time you pick it up on, on radar, it's already, it's already 50 miles downrange. Uh, you can't hear it. You can't see it. It hits you before you know it's coming. Um, and that would be obviously a very effective way to, to start a surprise attack. But there's something even more intriguing, uh, and the best way to describe this, if you've ever accidentally put a spoon or a tin can in a microwave and hit start, what happens next is not pretty. The thing you know, practically explodes and could start a house fire. Well, we have a weapon that is uh, a, a very fast cruise missile. Think of it as a cruise missile or a drone that emits intense an immense microwave radiation and flies over very close proximity to the target set, but it moves and it basically fries everything in its path. It fries all the electronics. So one of the challenges you mentioned, that's a big one, what if you go from fixed site launchers to mobile launchers? Well, that's a big deal because if, if it's a fixed site, I can probably whack it. But if it's mobile and you move it around mm. continually and I don't know where it is, it's much harder. But if I know the kind of the right zip code or maybe even the whole country, if I have enough of these things, I fly them over and I and I fl I fry all the electronics. So when you hit the launch button, nothing happens because it doesn't work. So um, this is these are some of the U.S. capabilities. Don't underestimate the U.S. and our technological edge uh, when it comes to this. But just to wrap up, I my view is we're we're still heading for war. There have been some positive developments. Um, superficially on the diplomatic stage, and I wouldn't discount them. They're certainly worth pursuing. At the end of the day, the U.S. wants to be able to say, we tried everything possible. We pursued every path. Don't blame us if we start this war because we were left with no choice. Um, but there is a little bit, a little tiny little dot of, of ray of sunshine there, but I don't think it's going anywhere. And I, I pushed the uh, timing back from uh, winter to summer, you know, if you know the history of the Korean War and the Battle of Chosan Reservoir and the what the, what the first Marine um, uh, first Marine Division did, uh, you don't want to fight in Korea in the winter if you can avoid it. So that's another reason it might be sure. the summer. Yeah, that makes sense. And you know the whole thing about a tiny little daughter ray of hope. You know that the, when you explained uh, the process in regards to our response, you know, no preconditions and we'll talk. You know, the thing that immediately came to my mind was that sends a clear message to uh, King Kim Jong-un that, that he's right. Like, look, I'm right. They're backing down. It, it, that's what I saw. You, it, I agree. You see, you literally can't win. If you don't, if you don't open the door, you're the stubborn one, you're the recalcitrant one, you're the warmonger. If you do open the door, oh, see, it proves he's bluffing. You yeah. lose out of the way. And that and that's how wars start when two it's not because everybody says let's have a war. It's because two sides misapprehend the intentions and capabilities of the other. Yep. And that's exactly what as you're exactly right, Alex. That's exactly what we're saying. Okay. All right. The uh, final part of our uh, podcast for today, uh, this is part three, system lockdown. In other words, ICE-9. I've heard you use the term ICE-9, Jim. Um, <clears throat> and then also capital uh, funneling into what I call choke points. And so there is this sort of ongoing process whereby 
political elites around the world are slowly taking over more and more control of people's ability to navigate freely when it comes to their finances. And, and this isn't any news to anybody. We are, we're all aware of what's been happening here. Um, and, you know, this sort of recent populist uh, action that's been occurring around the world may even be accelerating this. If, it, if elites are starting to see threats to their control, that might be accelerant on this process. One of the most recent examples of this is that in the EU, there's a new law that's been adopted that allows customs authorities to confiscate any amount of money, even if it's under $10,000, solely based upon an officer's suspicion that it's being used for illegal purposes. I am not even joking about this. I mean, when I first read this, it was like I, I, I had to read it a couple of times to wrap my mind around it. The law redefines money or cash also to include gold, gemstones such as diamonds, for example, and prepaid anonymous cash cards. Uh, they're now able to do this without any proof of a crime. Basically, they can confiscate the private property of anybody crossing a border within the EU, and people are basically subject to the, the, uh, the good judgment of the confiscating officer. So, th I mean, this violates natural rights uh, I'm sorry, this violates natural rights in a way that is, uh, it's kind of alarming in the direction it's pointing us, not just for Europeans, but really for all of humanity. It's because, um, it's, this is not picking on the EU. This, th there are similar trends in motion all around the world right now. And of course, every time something like this happens, whether it's, you know, Jim, you and I have talked about this is the war in cash, the war in gold. Every time something like this happens, it's being framed as, closing loopholes exploited by criminals. And in other words, uh, um, as political elites continue to remove people's freedoms in these areas and commit actions where, just being honest, if any other person were to be doing it, they'd be a criminal if, if they did these kind of things. It's being made to sound like this is done for all of our own good. And, and uh, I don't think um, anybody within the the reach of my voice actually believes that. But um, one of the politicians who wrote this law said, large sums of cash, be it banknotes or gold bullion, are often, often used for criminal activities such as money laundering or terrorist financing. And that just blows me away because I've been in the gold business for a decade. I've, and I'm not suggesting that this doesn't actually happen, but I've never seen anything like that. And, uh, you know, this is playing out exactly as we've discussed from time to time on this podcast, Jim. They, these guys are demonizing and associating the use of gold bullion with criminals. And, uh, <clears throat> just like, politicians around the world have done with large banknotes and cash in order to ban those large banknotes. And I'll make one more final comment before we start diving into questions for you, Jim, is, is that uh, there's a gentleman by the name of Juan Fernando Lopez, who was part of this EU commission, who added, we have tried to strike the right balance between this instrument, which aims to strengthen on the basis of international or internal market, the control of the cross-border cash passing through the external borders of the European Union and protecting legitimate interests. So making it proportional. So, right, I've got a ton of questions for you on this area, but first of all, Jim, what do you think this guy means by protecting legitimate interests and making it proportional? Well, a, a couple of things, Alex, there's a short version and a long version, but the short, the short version is when people say I have money in the bank, I say, no, you don't. Uh, it's not your money, it's the bank's money, and they'll decide when and if you can have it. So don't ever think that your money in the bank is something you can get your hands on very easily. I know you can walk up to an ATM and take out whatever, 500 bucks or 1,000 bucks or whatever, but you'll very quickly hit uh, – uh, cash withdrawal limits, um, uh, reporting limits. Uh, they're, they're sending in reports to the Treasury, uh, you know, et cetera, and then telling you have to come back to get your cash, come back by appointment. So it's it's not your money, it's theirs, number one. Um, number two, uh, this whole um, 
Uh, my my question this is sort of a, a, you know, kind of a meta question or a big question. Um, whatever happened to the presumption of innocence? In other words, do some criminals use gold? Yeah, but not not most of the people are in it. And other words, why don't you just say, look, we're going to arrest the entire population of the United States and incarcerate them because we know some of you people are criminals. It's ridiculous. Some some of you are criminals, so we're going to arrest everybody, and that way we'll get the criminals in jail. That. Mm may sound absurd, but that's what they're doing. They're saying, sure. we're going to make all the all these transactions impossible, all these transactions reportable, all these transactions suspicious, because some subset of you may be doing nasty things. And I don't doubt that there's some bad people out there. Of course there are. But there is a presumption of innocence. There is due process. There are constitutional rights that's all being thrown out uh, thrown out the window. And and what you described about Europe is already true in the United States. That yeah. Is in is Section three twelve of the Patriot Act lowers the normal Fourth Amendment uh, reasonable cause standard to something I the exact word I think was reasonable suspicion, but whatever the exact words in a row are, it, it lowered the standard for for seizing funds um, in particular. So um, this is this all comes under the heading of something I call Ice Nine. Ice Nine is a is a nice name that I nicked from uh, Kurt Vonnegut Jr., who wrote uh, a book called Cat's Cradle. In 1964, great uh, short novel, highly recommended, hilarious and very dark. Um, but uh, in, in Ice Nine, it was a, a, a sort of a science physicist who invented a doomsday machine consisting of a, a molecule of something close to water, but it had a freezing temperature of uh, it was frozen at room temperature, and had another property which was if Ice Nine came in contact with H2O, the H2O turned into Ice Nine. So the idea was if you if you dropped one drop of ice nine in a, a stream or river, it would eventually freeze and the ocean would freeze and the lakes would freeze and the whole world would freeze and life on earth would die. And that was that was the doomsday machine. Mm -hmm. And I use that as a metaphor, it's colorful, but I use it as a metaphor for how they're gonna lock down the financial system in the next financial panic, which is to say, um, you know, I said earlier that uh, in 2008, there was no way to stop, uh, to freeze money market funds. It actually wasn't legal. Legal, and it was not in those documents, and it was because everyone felt they could get their money out of money market funds, and they were doing it that the the uh, the Federal Reserve or the, um, the the Treasury had to guarantee them. They, they had to guarantee them as a way of getting people to calm down because there was no other way to stop the outflows, and the system was having a heart attack. That has changed since then. The SEC has changed the laws, and now money market funds, uh, certain kinds of money market funds, may suspend redemptions, and they will. So people, if they think they can get their money out of the money market funds, they're going to find that they can't. Uh, and then they say, well, I'm going to take it out of the bank. And then they'll have to shut the banks, which FDR did in 1933. Then they'll sell stocks. And they'll say, well, we're going to have to sh close the stock exchange, which uh, has been done many times, but it was closed for five months, for example, in 1914. Um, and on and on and on. So, so the, the demand for liquidity is going to pivot pivot from venue to venue to venue to get the liquidity and they're going to have to lock them all down close them all you know turn off the atms exactly the way ice nine turns water into more ice nine and eventually the whole planet freezes so this was not just a metaphor but actually backed up by a lot of documentation a lot of research uh showing that that all those rules are in place they're just waiting for the next opportunity now uh, November 2014, Brisbane, Australia, G20 meeting, they articulated the theory of the bail-in. Uh, the bail-out, of course, is, um, you know, we, the government comes in, uses taxpayer money to prop up a financial institution, and it's all good, uh, and the bankers get richer, and they pay themselves bonuses, and the stockholders and the bondholders make out fine, and ta taxpayers are kind of left holding the bag. Um they so what the G20 says no more bail outs from now on we're going to have bail ins and the way mm -hmm. a bail in works is that when a bank gets into distress the bondholders and the depositors are going to be at risk they're going to say no taxpayer money until um, you know stock has been wiped out equity is zero bondholders have taken a haircut and if it's still not enough uninsured deposits are going to take a haircut uh, and uh, all you people are going to have to suffer losses before we get to the taxpayers. And by the way, that is what happened in Cyprus in 2015. They had a banking panic in Cyprus, another one in Greece, um, and those rules were applied. And that they're uh, they were sort of 
sort of uh, blurred a little bit in the Banca di Monte Pesci, uh, Pesci uh, situation in Italy uh, over the objections of Germany, but that's how the system's supposed to work. Now, what's new is, and what, this is the paper you were referring to, Alex, they're now saying, eh, we're not so sure about the insured part. In other words, uh, bank deposits in Europe are insured up to 100,000 euros, and then beyond that, you were subject to... Uh, uh, taking a haircut under this bail-in rule. Now they're saying, no, uh, we think even the insured deposit, the insured deposit scheme might apply if a single bank failed and that's all there was to it. But in a systemic risk situation, why should even small depositors get better treatment than somebody else? So that's where that the language you referred to where, you know, we're going to act rateably and we're going to, you know, treat everybody the same. What they mean is, is that if you're, even if you're assured, depositor, you're subject to the bail-in rules, mm -hmm. uh, which means your deposit insurance will might help you in a single bank failure. It will not help you in a systemic crisis. Uh, you also mentioned that under this new directive, um, cash has now been redefined to include gold. Uh, so if, right. you, if you walked into Europe, got off a plane in Paris with, you know, a uh, a million dollars in in hundred dollar bills, which weighs exactly twenty two pounds, by the way. Um, if uh, uh, that that has always been subject to possibly to some degree of confiscation, but now they're saying if you have gold coins, uh, we're going to treat that as cash for purposes of anti money laundering and um, uh, and reporting and seizure purposes. So we um, we did say that the war on cash, which has been ongoing, would turn into the war on gold. And that's already happening. So whether it's your deposits uh, losing their insurance in a systemic crisis, uh, so they're part of the bail-in, uh, money market funds being able to suspend redemptions, gold being treated as cash for any money laundering purposes subject to seizure. The, and, of course, we all know what happened in India last year and um, and uh, many, many other examples. And you're right, this is a global phenomenon. But just to, to sum up, Alex, what I would say is that Everything we're talking about, war on cash, war on gold, ICE-9, I have written about in my books. I did forecast it. I know it's coming. Uh, where I'm surprised, it's coming faster than I would have estimated. I would have said, hey, you know, read my book. Read, uh, you know, read The Road to Ruin if you want to learn about ICE-9 um, and, and these bank freezes. Uh, but, you know, and watch out for that because in the next couple of years, this is going to happen. And it's actually happening in, in a matter of months. This is happening very quickly. And I do think that's a good indicator of the um, concern that central bankers know that their days are numbered and the, the next crisis is coming and they're not prepared. And, of course, that's consistent with what we said at the beginning of the podcast about Janet Yellen's new factor. Uh, it's not, it, you now have a new factor in the Fed model, which is they're going to lean towards tightening even if disinflation is present because they're worried about systemic risk and financial um, stability. Sure. And, you know, we've talked about sort of where this is all headed a, a couple of different times. And, and one thing that you've said, Jim, is, is that, you know, the idea with banning cash, et cetera, is, is not just to be able to achieve um, negative interest rates if, if the powers that be decide that that's what, what the economy needs, but also to sort of corral people into into digital money. I mean, what is your view? What is the end game here? Where, where does that go and um, what does it lead to and what are you suggesting people do uh, as sort of precautionary measures against this? Well, if I want to, uh, if I want to freeze your money or seize your money, uh, which central banks and finance ministries and governments do, or at least they want that option, and they will use, they will exercise that option when the time comes, then it's extremely helpful for me to force you into digital forms because you can do it with a couple of keystrokes. Um, the, uh, you know, like I say, if you're going to slaughter pigs. The first thing you do is you round the pigs up into a pen, and then you you drive them through a chute, and then you kill them. And so um, the same thing with depositors and savers and investors. If I'm going to slaughter you with freezes and haircuts and and ice nine, I've got to round you up into a digital pen, force you into a digital account at one of a relatively small number of banks. Um, so that's what they're doing. Now the question is, what can you do? What can individuals do to push back against that, you know, being led to the slaughterhouse. 
Um, there are two ways. One is not very easy, which is physical cash. Um, all I can say there is, you know, can you get it? Yeah, but be prepared to spend a lot of time at the teller and uh, give a lot of uh, ID and perhaps have to come back depending on the amount and uh, expect that they'll fire off a CTR, SAR, currency transaction report, suspicious activity report that will go to the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network and be put in a file right next to uh, Osama bin Laden and ISIS. So that's how they treat you if you want your cash. Um, the, the other alternative, which at least for now, uh, does not have a lot of uh, red tape, doesn't seem to be on the radar screen and works just fine, is gold bullion. So I recommend, and silver, but I recommend uh, gold and silver bullion for um, for investors, savers, whether you're a large institution, you can buy, you know, buy a couple tons and stick it in a in a vault in a, with custody, or uh, it can be held. Uh, the physical gold fund offers a uh, their their units, but the gold is there; it's fully allocated, deliverable, uh, on demand, you know, et cetera, non bank storage. Everything about that is as as safe as uh, you can make it. Uh, or, um, or for you know the smaller holder, uh, you know American Gold Eagles, or I, I definitely recommend people have a, what's called a monster box. This comes right from the Treasury. Uh, they're a nice shade of Treasury green. So right from the mint, rather, but the mint's part of the U.S. Treasury. Nice shade of Treasury green. It's 500 one ounce American silver eagles um, in a nice case with a with a compression strap around it. Um, they run, you know, depending on the market, they run around ten thousand uh, dollars. You know, getting five hundred ounces, they'll be about twenty dollars an ounce with commission, maybe a little bit less, maybe nine thousand change. But uh, I recommend them same way. I recommend battery, flashlights, and water if the hurricane's coming. Um, if you don't have electricity and and the ATMs don't work work and the gas station pumps don't work and the scanners don't work and the credit cards don't work and the debit cards don't work. Uh, a little silver might be just what you need to feed your family. And certainly for for wealth storage, wealth preservation, you want gold. Yep. And that's, uh, by the way, that's also, I agree, that's a really good point you just made about, uh, you know, in a crisis. And, and people are like, well, you know, we're not going to have that kind of a crisis, but you never know. It doesn't have to be a financial zombie apocalypse collapse. It could be, uh, it could be a hurricane. You know, it just happens down in Puerto Rico where, where, um, and, I, and I've talked to people from there who basically said they didn't have access to ATMs. They couldn't get money out. Nobody had money. Uh, and it was just, it was, a it was, uh, it was horrible. So yeah, it's a, it's a pretty good point. And, and there's a number of things that could lead to that. It doesn't have to be just financial. It could be, you know, it could be war. It could be, uh, a number of different things that, that, that caused that. So, um, an excellent summary and discussion today, Jim. I really appreciate it. And uh, to all of our listeners out there, uh, we want to wish you a, a wonderful holiday season. We will talk to you again in the uh, in the upcoming new year. And Jim, thanks so much for being on with us today. Thank you, Alex. You have been listening to The Gold Chronicles. Jim Rickards and Alex Stance, presented by Physical Gold Fund. Recordings can be found at physicalgoldfund.com forward slash podcasts. You can register there for news of upcoming interviews with Jim Rickards and other world-class thinkers.